Welcome back to the A Conscious Universe review. In this video, we're covering chapters 9 and 10, and chapter 9 is called Scientific Bible, and it's pretty much the same thing as those scientific miracles in the Quran apologetics we hear so much, except about the Bible, obviously. Almondos are mostly taken from Ray Comfort and other places. I will say, as abjectly terrible as the last chapter was, a lot of it did have the feel of being Almondo's original thinking. Obviously based on arguments he'd heard before, not ones unique to him, but nobody seriously expected that. That's actually pretty hard to achieve. Actually though, the Big Bang stuff, that might have been unique to him. But that wasn't really an argument, it was more of a straw man. But yeah, whatever degree of originality the last chapter had, this one doesn't. Anyway, buckle up, because this next part might get confusing. On the first page of chapter 9, he has resource. Credit to Ray Comfort at christianost.com slash scientific facts in the Bible. Seems okay at first sight, but christianost.com doesn't exist. christianpost.com exists, and of course that's what's meant. On the back cover of the book it's even worse. christianoct.com slash ray-comfort. How did he get OCT? by not caring at all about accuracy, that's how. Now, after correcting the URL by adding the missing P, it still doesn't work because the cited page, Scientific Facts in the Bible, doesn't exist, because Elmando didn't bother to copy the actual URL. He just typed out something vaguely similar to it. Again, why not just learn to copy and paste? The correct URL is christianpost.com slash voices slash scientific facts in the Bible dot html. So really not that close to what he wrote. That wasn't the confusing part. Now starts the real confusion. Because none of what follows comes from that article. There's an explanation of how the Book of Job supposedly mentions gravity, then there's some stuff about Isaac Newton, then there's some stuff about the water cycle, and none of it is from Ray's article. Instead, it's ripped directly from this article on Florida International University's website. He also provides a quote which he attributes to Isaac Newton, and it goes, In Principia, Newton described gravity as an ever-present force, a tug that all objects exert on nearby objects. The more mass an object has, the stronger its tug. Increasing the distance between two objects weakens the attraction. Now that might sound like an odd thing for Isaac Newton to say about himself. Did he have a habit of speaking about himself in the third person, and the past tense, and 21st century English? Now, the quote's stolen from an American Museum of Natural History article about Newton. Obviously he didn't say that, and yet for some unfathomable reason Almondo attributed it to him. After that bizarre bit of plagiarism and misattribution, Almondo talks about what Newton theorized, and the whole thing is stolen from Encyclopedia Britannica. So to summarize, he cites a reference, but the reference URL is misspelled, and it's incorrect even if the spelling is corrected, and it doesn't contain anything he's saying, because instead of using that reference, he's taken pages of material from multiple unrelated sources, trying to pass it all off as his own work. Oh, and by the way, when he had to spell Isaac Newton himself, to introduce a bit of plagiarism, he spelled Isaac with one A and two C's, even though the very next word after Isaac Newton is his plagiarized copy of Isaac Newton's name, which is spelled correctly. And then, as I said, the next part about the water cycle is stolen from FIU. I'm not going to bother with these arguments. They're not his arguments. Everything is unique, everything is new, and everything is original. The material in this book is, are going to be arguments that you have never heard and that are irrefutable. Why? Because even for the time being, these are new, fresh new arguments for the existence of God and the reliability of the New Testament. These are fresh new arguments, arguments that have never been heard from any apologist, and arguments that have never been heard before. The only thing maybe worth saying is that on page 110 he refers to evaporation, precipitation, and condensation as core values, which for some reason I find hilarious. He misuses the word value a lot in this book. He repeats the citation of the resource with the same URL, slightly modified, which also goes nowhere. At least Christian Post has a P this time. 
The wrong URL he gives is www.christianpost.com slash amp slash scientific facts in the Bible. If I put the missing .html after this, it actually works. So why did he cite this two pages ago if he was planning to spend the next two pages stealing other random crap? I don't know, who cares I guess? Most things in the next pages come straight from that article. There's no attempt made to indicate their quotations, and Almando regularly changes the wording to obscure the fact that he's copying directly from there. It's good that he at least provided a broken URL and said it was a resource, but since he made no effort to make it clear that all of this came from that resource directly, and in fact made an effort to obscure the fact that it was taken directly from there, guess what, it's plagiarism. Previously, it seemed like maybe Armando kind of got the point, but now it seems like he can't be bothered. I guess whether he gives a damn or not just depends on the day. Here's more stuff he took from Ray, here's more stuff he took from Ray. Apparently both he and Ray are impressed by this Jeremiah quote that says there's lots of stars. The host of heaven cannot be numbered, which is basically the same thing as, wow, that's a lot of stars, I can't count all those. Yeah, neither can I. They're not even in a pattern, how would I even keep track of what I've already counted? But apparently this shows that they knew some great undiscovered scientific fact about the universe. There are countless billions of stars and an estimated 1,025 billion big stars in the observable universe. Which is incredibly specific and also comically low. Where's he getting this nonsense number? Well, from a dumbass typo in the Ray Comfort article he's copying, of course. This stuff about blood carrying water and nourishment is from the same Ray Comfort article, but Ray Comfort plagiarized it from the New Defender Study Bible by Henry Morris, the father of modern young earth creationism. And Ray, just like Almondo does, switched the sentence around a bit to obscure his plagiarism. The original says blood carries water and nourishment, maintains the body's temperature, and removes waste material. Ray switched that around to carries water and nourishment, removes waste material, and maintains the body's temperature. And then Almondo copied that order, Ray's order, and he has this section about blood directly following the section about 1,025 stars, just like in Ray's article. So not only is Almondo plagiarizing, he's plagiarizing what was already plagiarism. Remarkable. Below that he has a quote from the Bible, John 19 verses 31 through 34, where there's a part that's in bold that exactly matches this blog post, and the translation matches too. His description about it doesn't match, and of course a bit of bold text is not enough to call this plagiarism, but it is strange. Not sure what's going on there. This part about the Earth's interior being mentioned in Job 28.5 is plagiarized from, I think, this website? Baguio Herald Express Online? And all the description about the interior of the Earth is indirectly copied from National Geographic, which that Herald Express Online site actually cites, and Almondo removes the citation. Science needs God in order to work. Science means with knowledge. Knowledge comes from a conscious mind, a mind of great power and authority. Is that how we think scientific knowledge is generated? By asking God for it? Well, now we have four pages straight of Bible quotes. He cites Genesis 1 verses 1 through 31, but then only includes verses 1 through 5 with an ellipsis at the end, which exactly matches the formatting on openbible.info. That also cites Genesis 1 verses 1 through 31, but only shows 1 through 5 with an ellipsis at the end. The whole early part of his list matches the open Bible universe topic. 2 Peter 3 verse 5 has a comma left over at the end, exactly like open Bible. All of the quotes up to X Exodus 20 verse 11 in his list appear in the Open Bible list in the same order that they appear in Almondo's book, and in the same translation. There are other verses in between them though, so there's some filtering going on. A lot of the other verses appear in a search on the same site for Earth, which goes well with what he said about these being passages in the Bible about the Earth and the universe. Search for Earth, search for universe, there you go. The ones on page 117 appear in an Open Bible search for science. Daniel 2.21 retains the semicolon at the end, just as in Open Bible. The formatting of all the ones that come from Open Bible is identical to that site, even in the little punctuational peculiarities. And there are five passages that don't appear in the Open Bible searches, and they tend to be in different translations. The Open Bible searches are in ESV, and these ones are in NIV and others. Now, is any of this a major problem? Eh, not really. It's weird. 
And maybe it would have been good to iron out the foibles of the open Bible records of these verses. Don't keep all the weird mid-sentence stops and odd punctuation. But I don't take issue with the fact that he used open Bible for some hints as to what to include. That site's just a big database of verses and their associations with words. It's not like they were written by the creators of the site, and the order of them on the site wasn't created by a human at all, I don't think. I just thought it was interesting to see where he was getting his ideas for these. These are some extra verses that give light to the wisdom and scientific knowledge that the Word of God holds. These are verifiable proofs that have never been actually disproved. Every argument against these facts are emotional and in denial. When real arguments are raised, they fall back into the hands of truth and become nothing more than arguments for God. So apparently to Almondo, any appeal to truth at all constitutes an argument for God. Hell, no wonder he assumes atheists believe in God, then. If we say, I don't believe in God, that's a truth claim and therefore an argument for God, apparently. Pure madness. Now up until this point I hadn't paid much attention to what these verses actually contained, but upon reading this I looked back at them more carefully. Now I'm going to summarize each one very briefly, and comment quickly on whether it's a verifiable proof, as he claims they all are, and whether they've been disproven, if that's relevant. So Hebrews 11.3 says people believe on faith that God's word made the universe, which is obviously true, some people do. Genesis 1, 1 through 5 says God made the universe, and lists some steps that took. Now, I would agree these first few verses of Genesis are not disproven, but nor is it a verifiable proof. No attempt is made to prove it here, nor anywhere else in the Bible, in fact. Psalm 19.1 and Psalm 8 verses 3 through 4 basically say the sky shows the work of God, and they just say it and move on. No verifiable proof in sight. Romans 1.20 just says stuff exists, therefore God, and this total non-argument supposedly leaves people without excuse for not believing. No attempt at proving. 2 Peter 3.5 says the heavens are old and the earth was made of water. No attempt made to prove these claims. The first part's true, much to the chagrin of young earthers like Almondo, and the second part actually is pretty much disproven by modern geology. Colossians 1.16-17 says God created everything and holds it together, no attempt to prove it. Exodus 20, 11 says God made the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, no attempt to prove it. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says God made humans, no proof in sight. Revelation 4, 11 says God made everything, no proof. Psalm 139, 13 through 14 says God makes people in the womb, no proof. Nehemiah 9, 6 says God made the heavens and the earth, no proof. Acts 14, 15 scolds people and says God made the heaven and the earth and the sea, of course entirely without proof. Amos 9.6 says God pours seawater on the earth. No proof of the God part, but this could be the first instance of a not altogether obvious statement about the natural world so far, if it were taken to refer to evaporation. But the trouble is, it's not about evaporation. It's about a natural disaster, like a flood following an earthquake. That's shown from the context of the previous verses. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell in it mourn, and all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again, like the Nile of Egypt. Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 5 says the sun rises and sets, and the fact that this is presented as remarkable scientific knowledge is hilarious. And we already have a very good non-God explanation for the day-night cycle. Daniel 2, 21 says God makes seasons. Well, seasons are obvious, but the claim that God causes them isn't, and there's no attempt to prove it. And of course, we already have a very good explanation for seasons. Genesis 9, 13 through 15 and Ezekiel 1, 28 say there are rainbows, and the former says God made one of them. Again, the phenomenon is obvious, God causing it is not, and we already have an explanation for rainbows. Because we understand them, I can make one myself with a garden hose and a bit of metallicized high salt. Metallicized high salt. And finally, Genesis 1, 20 through 25 says God made animals, no attempt to prove it. So these supposed verifiable proofs not only contain no proof, they don't even contain any attempts at proof. These are claims, they're not evidence for the claims. There's a difference. Now yes, some of these claims are demonstrably true. To a person standing on Earth, the sun appears to rise and set. There are seasons, there are rainbows. Some people believe in God. But what unifies all these true claims is that they're utterly mundane, and they've been known to everyone in history who had eyes. And these incredibly obvious facts, which would be harder not to discover than to discover, are somehow supposed to show the wisdom and scientific knowledge of the Bible? You can't be serious. And yet, somehow, you 
are, to the point that you'll claim that anyone pointing out the utter unimpressiveness of these verses is emotional and in denial. But now we're on to chapter 10. This entire chapter is Bible prophecies. Almost all of them are copied from somewhere else. The first batch of copying spans pages 119 through 137. It's funny, you know, he seems to start doing this when he runs out of steam. The previous book did the same thing towards the end. His books are like a little record of his feelings. They start off all enthusiastic, with lots to say, and then eventually he gets bored, he gets tired, and decides to just dump big lists from other people to pad out 10 or 20 pages. It's hard to write 144 pages double-spaced, you know, or whatever the spacing in this book is, one and a half spaced, fluctuating between various line spacings. Okay, it's hard to write a 144 page book of often varying, but consistently more than 1.0 line spacing, you know. Anyway, for these prophecies, he cites a resource again, perish.rcdow.org.uk slash prophecies of Jesus. As usual, that URL does not work. A quick search of the site found his prophecies in only one place. A PDF at this URL here, which is not even slightly close to what he claimed it was. How exactly does Almondo think the internet works? Does he think the browser just sort of takes a suggestion and then figures out the details for you? As I keep asking, why didn't he just copy-paste the actual URL? We'll probably never have a solid answer. So he's put the entire list of 44 prophecies from that PDF here, in the exact same order, with the exact same references to Bible verses. Now in the PDF, the Bible verses are just referenced, book, chapter, verse, but he's trying to pad the length of his book, so he's got to include their text as well. Which, if you're going to pad the length, I suppose including the Bible verses you're talking about is an okay way to do that. He's also changed the text a little bit to make it less clear that it's directly copied. Like, for example, in the original it says, Messiah would be born of a woman. And here that's changed to, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was prophesied to be born of a woman. Real impressive prophecy, by the way, that one. The Messiah will be born the same way as everyone else? Better watch out for that. Anyway, these minor changes don't make it at all less obvious what's happened here. This exact kind of failure is repeated so often through the book, citing a resource but then just copying all the text from it into his book with his own changes and no sign that it's a quotation, despite the resource reference meaning there's a 100% chance of him being caught red-handed. In that repetition of the same problem, each time starting with a reference that's direct evidence of his guilt, makes me think that he might sincerely think this is how it's supposed to be done. Otherwise, why would he provide a reference at all, even if it is an incorrect URL. But again, it didn't have to be this way. This could have been fixed with just a bit of humility. If this is a sincere mistake, and the thought had simply occurred to Almondo that he might lack some knowledge, and need some help to understand how citations work, he would have just looked up how to do it and had this problem solved in a matter of minutes. But unfortunately, intellectual humility seems to be the last thing Almondo is capable of, and so he confidently did the exact same wrong thing multiple times, after having been told many, many times that that's not how it's done, and then he published it. Pages 136 and 137 have images from the Passion of the Christ. Meh. He continues with some other prophecies. The first is Prophecy of the Mankind's Immoralities. Here he cites 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, where Paul lists off some negative personality traits people will have in the last days, as if all the other days don't also have people who act in these ways. It's similar to the Bible's grand scientific wisdom that the sun rises and sets, just stating something incredibly obvious that for some reason people like Almondo now take as impossible without supernatural influence. Not the most impressive prophecy, but the second citation is even less impressive. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, which is a definition of what activities count as works of the flesh. This isn't meant as a prophecy at all. It's just a clarification to people of the time on how not to act. I don't know how he got so badly confused here, but it does make it easier to believe that this is his original work. He goes on to claim that people, just in general I guess, are becoming more immoral over time to try to convince the reader that we're in the last days. He lists off what he thinks is some immoral behavior of people these days, which considering the kind of Christian he is I'm sure you can guess without help, and then says, These things are clear evidence to the rebellious and wicked hearts of man. 
Um, okay, but that wasn't what this was supposed to be evidence of. It was supposed to be, quote, clear evidence that the Bible is true and is the word of God. He forgot what he was talking about between the start of the page and the end of it. He has a section called Prophecy of the Rebuilding of the Temple, which is entirely plagiarized from this site with no citation. The Bible quote is also in that article. But the funny thing is it doesn't mention the temple at all. So how is this a prophecy about a temple? Well, it isn't. That's how. At the end, Almando says, For further details on these facts, visit the Israel News Information website. Which is as meaningless of nonsense as call the copyright. It gives us no indication of what he's actually referring to. Then there's a section of a prophecy about a red heifer, and it's all plagiarized from this site. It's about how they've bred a real nice red cow that's a candidate for sacrificing. The Bible quote he provides refers to God wanting the priest to sacrifice a red cow with no blemish. So just one of those red reddish colored cows with nothing wrong with it. You know, don't sacrifice the crap one, give me the good one. Not exactly a high bar, especially when in modern times people are specifically breeding for redness, as they seem to be. The page says this cow is, quote, being raised and specially cared for under the auspices of the Temple Institute's Raise a Red Heifer program. So again, people are intentionally breeding for redness the same way people breed for any other feature. Does Almondo or these people realize that fulfilled prophecies are not impressive when the true believers do their best to fulfill it. That's not the prophecy coming true because someone in the past knew the future. It's the prophecy coming true because someone in the future knew the past, which is much less impressive. And what makes this somehow even less impressive is that here again we have the same problem as the immorality prophecy. It's not a prophecy. It just says what God supposedly asked Moses and Aaron to do. There's no reference to the future here. How can a prophecy be fulfilled if there's no prophecy to start with? Then there's a section about the drying up of the Euphrates River prophecy, which is plagiarized from a bunch of places. The first sentence is from here, a couple more sentences from here, a bit more of it possibly from here. Now this Facebook post seems to be some kind of transcription of something else, with words inexplicably missing at the ends of sentences. The word after environmental is missing, which presumably is why Almando put chaos in there, which is not the original word. I'll show you how I know that in a second. Some more of it came from the subheadline here, and all of this is put together in exactly the order Almando has it in this Facebook video. The drying up of Euphrates, Syria's longest river, is raising concerns as the demise of the water body could lead to a humanitarian disaster in the country. Iraq is battling its worst drought in decades. Lack of rainfall and poor resource management has left communities that depend on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers devoid of the water they need to survive. The drying up of Middle East is not a prophecy anymore. It is not a prediction. It is a fact that is happening. Five largest lakes in the Middle East are already drying up. Rising temperature and mismanagement are contributing to water insecurity and could lead to environmental crises. By the way, doesn't that narrator sound just like the satanic priest from Metalocalypse? Um, okay, this is a church of Satan. This isn't a waste paper basket. Can. Better watch out, Almondo. You might be listening to the preachings of the wrong religion there. So the plagiarism here is weird and complicated in the way that only internet whack jobbery can be. I found this stuff being copied around all over the place. So regardless of where exactly he took it from, the point is Almondo yoinked it for his book. After all this, he says, The Bible could not have gotten more specific than this. Except it did. It got far more specific than this. The prophecy he's referring to in no way just says, at some point there will be a drought that affects the Euphrates River. That alone would not be very impressive at all. It's bound to happen eventually. It's sort of along the line of that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars verse, though at least a little bit less silly. The verses Almando includes are far, far more specific than this. He cites Revelation 17, 1 through 18, which doesn't mention the Euphrates at all. It's just rambling about the whore of Babylon. So I have no idea why he wasted a third of a page on it. I guess to pad out the length of his book. But the other two verses, Revelation 16, 12 and Isaiah 11:15, do mention it. And here's what they say. It will be dried up specifically to prepare the way for the kings from the east. The gulf of the Egyptian sea will be dried up along with the Euphrates. There will be a scorching wind over the Euphrates. And the river will be broken up into seven streams that anyone can cross over in sandals. That's a fair bit more specific. The river will be dried up specifically so as to not impede the progress of some presumed 
presumably invading kings from the east. Now, there aren't an awful lot of those these days, particularly east of the Euphrates River. Maybe the kings of Thailand and Cambodia are going to join forces and invade Syria? Yeah, I'll keep an eye on the news, but I don't expect to see that. And then it specifies that the river will become seven small streams. Again, reasonably specific and not at all what's happening right now. So despite the claim that the Bible could not have gotten more specific, it could, and it did, and so far what it said should be happening doesn't seem to be happening. To deny this occurrence and claim a coincidence is a delusional mindset. Well, luckily I do neither of those. Water levels in the Euphrates have been lower than usual, and there's no coincidence because this doesn't coincide with the specifics of the verses you included. He goes on to explain that Revelation 16, quote, continues on to talk about specific details that clearly make this matter nothing less than a prophetic warning to the world. So he's telling us that the Bible got more specific, despite the declaration two sentences ago that it could not have, and then he cites more of the passage about the angel pouring out his bowl and drying up the river, and this expansion does indeed add many more specific details to the prophecy. After the kings of the east part, it adds the following. Three unclean spirits like frogs will come out of the mouth of a dragon, a beast, and a false prophet. These demon spirits will perform signs that will go out to the kings of the world. These signs will gather all the kings to a battle. Uh, Jesus will come as a thief, and the people who keep watch and thus keep their clothes and don't end up naked will be blessed. The juxtaposition makes me think Thief Jesus is in the business of stealing clothes, and people should be watching for him. And finally, these kings will be gathered together in a place called Armageddon in Hebrew. That is much, much, much more specific. None of that is happening. And yet, Almondo wants me to freak out about the end times and start believing the Bible was written by God because there happened to be a drought. It's absurd. Finally, he provides a URL for a webpage where we can learn, quote, further in-depth detailed information. He writes it as himitsustudy.com slash 2021 slash 10 slash 27 slash Euphrates dash river dash drying dash up. And against all odds, it's actually a working URL. So I went there and I read it and it completely contradicts everything Almondo's said. Here are some quotes. Although Revelation 16.12 does indeed talk about the drying up of the Euphrates, it elaborates this to us in a specific context. First, it takes place during the tribulation period, and more specifically towards the end, as it's the second to last bowl judgment. Second, we see that the drying up of the Euphrates at this point in time isn't caused by natural means such as a rise in temperature or an increase in severity of droughts. Third, the Bible not only provides the context as to when this will happen, but why this happens, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So is what's currently occurring to the Euphrates River a fulfillment of the sixth bowl judgment in Revelation 16? No. To say that would not only mean we're currently in the tribulation, but that all of the seal, trumpet, and majority of bowl judgments have been poured out on mankind, and that three demonic spirits have gone out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to the Battle of Armageddon in anticipation of Christ's second coming. This simply isn't the case scripturally, nor is it an accurate reflection of what's currently going on in the world. Many of us understand this, but regardless, this view is cropping up here and there, and due to that, I believe it's important to address to prevent confusion. Now that could not be more specific. So essentially they say what I just said, that just because you have one aspect of this prophecy, the most ordinary, everyday, normal one, I'd like to add, that doesn't mean you should just ignore all the rest of the prophecy and pretend it doesn't exist. What happened here, man? Why did you encourage your readers to read this article that doesn't agree with you at all? Did you just read the headline of this page and then assume the article said what you wanted it to? I should note, this is an end times news website, so not only am I, the atheist, saying you're wrong, but the hardcore Christians who run an end times news website that you chose to cite are telling you the same thing. Do you read any of these fucking websites that you cite? You had the same problem with AIG, you cited AIG and then you said, why do we still have monkeys? Which they took their time to write an entire article to debunk. Your book is so bad, you're putting me on the same side as Answers in Genesis and End Times News websites. I don't appreciate that. His final prophecy is One World Religion. I have no clue how he's going to justify this one, considering the vast number of different religions out there right now, and far more if you count different sects as functionally different religions. 
For decades, we have been witnessing the attempts of gathering all world religions together to establish some type of one world religious agreement in an attempt to become equal brethren in a belief where all gods are equal and one. Well, I'm sure some people have tried that. Those weird people with the coexist bumper stickers. That doesn't mean it's common, and it certainly doesn't mean it's actually succeeded, which is what would have to happen to fulfill a prophecy claiming it will happen. Pope Francis, with an E, like that one great aunt everyone has, who recently signed his signature on paper in agreement to establishing equal ground and religious values with Islam, decided to combine the two contradicting beliefs into one religion now called Chrislam. He doesn't specify what this document was that the Pope signed, but all I can find that fits is this. The Document on Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together, signed by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. It's a bit long, not that long, but too long for here. But to summarize, it basically says that people should stop fighting so much and get along better and help the poor and stuff like that. And that despite their differences, Catholics and Muslims believe in God, and that's the most important thing. In other words, we like nice things, and also we like God, so let's be nice and like God together. In no way is this some declaration of a merger of religions. There's nothing here that even remotely implies that. Really, it's just one of those fluffy bits of PR you see occasionally. If this really is what you mean, Elmondo, and I don't know what else you could mean, then do you actually take this as some kind of fulfillment of a prophecy of a single world religion? And look, even if this wasn't just a we like peace and love nothing burger, even if this literally said, we the Catholic Church and Sunni Islam declare that we and all our followers are no longer Catholic or Sunni but Chrislamic, that still wouldn't be anything close to a one world religion. For one thing, the members of those religions wouldn't just change their minds. And for another, there are far more religions in the world than Catholicism and Sunni. This is nonsense on every level. This is a clear demonstration of the pure deceit of mankind, and the support that this is getting is completely mind-blowing. This isn't a clear demonstration of anything you claim it demonstrates. And what support? This is the kind of thing that only appears in a slow news cycle and disappears halfway through it. The goal of oneness in religion is not what people think. It's a tactic to pull you away from the truth, and it's also a clear river flow into revealing and affirming biblical end times prophecy. And then he spends over a full page on the entire first 18 verses of Revelation 17. Again, a bunch of rambling about the whore of Babylon, the beast with seven heads, and so on. It says nothing about a one world religion, but Almondo chooses to interpret the woman as a metaphor for a one world religion because... Hell, why not? It's as good as anything else anyone else wants it to mean. This passage from Revelation 17 gives us several characteristics of the one world religion. The false religion will dominate all the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues of the earth, meaning that it will have universal authority, no doubt given by the Antichrist, who will rule the world at that time. So this prophecy of a woman and a beast and such doesn't mean what it says. It means what Almando wants it to say. And his prophecy hasn't been fulfilled, shows no serious sign of being fulfilled in any way, but it definitely will though, really, he promises. Be impressed, atheist. Please? He briefly mentions the mark of the beast, too, saying certain things about a virus that got wide publicity recently, which if I repeat on YouTube, the censor bots will probably smack me for. But the point is, that wasn't the mark of the beast. But sooner or later, we will be seeing a great advancement of what will be a mark of some sort that will be used to control, own, and divide the whole world. So he didn't mention the virus because it, or anything related to it, was the mark. It was just a thing that wasn't the mark, which makes it pointless for this discussion, because the important thing here is the some sort of thing that'll be the actual mark. And it'll happen, he promises, so be impressed, atheist. Amazing. These things are evident. Are they? And the more we dig deep, the more we are exposed to the truth. Are we? Nothing you said here seems to have much to do with truth. It doesn't seem like you care at all about what's true. But so that's the end of chapter 10, the final chapter of the book. I won't cover the very end of the book right now, I'll leave that till the end of the series. In the next video, we'll circle back around to the start and do chapter 1. Unfortunately, that chapter's dense enough to need one video all to itself. 
So thanks for watching, and if you would, please give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't, and if you like these book reviews or anything else I do, please do consider supporting the channel. A couple bucks per video or per month is enormously helpful, and as always, huge thanks to all of my supporters who've already made that choice. For early access, sign up to the email list, list.logict.com, and I'll see you next time.